Welcome to Fishing Britain. This week we spend a day at Bishop's Bowl Fishery, dobbing the margins for some sneaky, sneaky cap. We ask, what's in the panyan? And I hook a very unusual predator. But first, for all you game anglers out there, it's time to check your tackle before the opening day of the season. Right, you trout anglers, it's nearly time for a new season. You're full of excitement, you're ready to go. But before going out on that first day, there are a few things that I always do before going out, just in case you're there, you hook your first fish and things go wrong. So housekeeping, let's look at the rod to start with. Look at that guide. That's one of the most important ones, the tip ring. Check if there's any grooving. The second one to check is the bottom stripper guide. Those are the two on the rod that take the most pressure. Now, how does grooving happen? Well, the fly line can pick up some grit on the ground or on the bottom of the boat, and it just damages the ring. Next thing, handle. Sometimes you've got a damaged handle, there could be fillers in it, that's fallen out, there's a weakness there. Water will get into it, it'll damage all the rest of the cork. So, get some filler, fill it up, even overfill it a little bit and then emery paper so it's flush. Next thing, your reel seat. Could put a little bit of grease just on there so you're not gonna get cross threading and it's easy to get those reels on and off. The next thing, it's the fly reel. Well, bomb proof, aren't they? Yes and no, just check, free running. Check the disc drag at the back. Check the nut in the middle. Now, early season, you never know what depth those fish are at. So you might be changing lines three, four, five times. So if this is cross-threaded, there's nothing more frustrating out there. You can't get the spool off. So that one, maybe worth putting a little bit of grease on that. A little bit of grease on that one. So free moving. If you've got cassette spools, sometimes over the winter, the tension from the line and the backing on the spool it just relaxes. If you look at this closely, if I hold my hand on there, the spool's not moving, but the whole line is rotating. Even the backing is moving. So what do we need to do? We need to pull it all off, pull that backing tight again. Little tip for you, if you want that to prevent well, it happening in the future, little dab of super glue just on the backing so it stays solid on that cassette. Next thing is your braided loop. Have a look at it. Check the bottom end. They do have a tendency to, just between the top of the plastic sleeve and the line, tends to break after a while. So if it's broken, if the line's broken there, cut that off and put a new braided loop on. Next thing, the braided loop itself. Just check if there's any frayed ends. If there is, cut it off again and replace with a new one. End of last season, you should have put all your reels and spools away tidily. So when you picked your bag up at the start of the season here, Perfect, pristine, <laughs> not like mine. So all in a mess, so I'll spend half an hour to an hour making sure that everyone is spooled up. Might be worth you investing in some just spool retainers. They're very, very cheap, a couple of quid, and they just go, when the spool is off the reel, it just goes over there, holds all the line nice and tidy, and a lot of them i have got places that you can put what line it is so it's easy when it's sat on the top of your box you can just pick out exactly what you want two years ago i was caught out first day of the season top of my seat box pulled out first spool of fluorocarbon tied the first part to the line great three turn water knot snap thought okay this is 10 pound that shouldn't happen pulled a little bit off did it again did it again did it again chuck that spool away Next pool, next pool, next pool. Finally, this, I think it was the fifth or sixth pool actually held. If the spool gets wet and the fluorocarbon gets wet on it and then it dries on the spool, don't ask me why, and all the manufacturers can't tell me why, but it will become brittle. This is eight and a half pound breaking strain, right? This has been on since last year. It's been wet and look at that. Now just imagine that first fish of the season, it's hit you hard, it's gone. Fishing two, three flies, even a single fly, bang, it's gone. So always, always check your fluorocarbon. Then finally the business end, the flies. Now it's time of year to sit down and sort your boxes out. This one, nice and neat, okay? All separated into different patterns, easy to find. Uh, this one, 
it's time to sort it out, okay? There's all different colors mixed in, so I should have whites all together, I should have the olives together, I should have the blacks together, but because I've been using them on still waters, they go in and out, in and out, in and out. So time to sit down with that box. The other thing is time to check the flies as well. Um, to show you a couple here. Now in the box, that looks great. It, a, it is a tungsten bead humongous, but the hackles come off. It looks all right there, but a closer inspection, the hackle itself is moving um, and it's about to fall off. So that one, don't check it away um, because the hook is still all right. The bead is still all right. So razor blade the whole pattern, uh, take all the body, the tail and the body off and retie another humongous on that one. Now, this should be a proper colored cat's whisker, but the frit, because there's a bit of rust there now, I need to razor blade that off and just check there's no rust on the hook. Really nice crisp packet buzzer here, but the eye has got rust in. The back end of the fly has got rust in. Rust means dodgy hooks. It means time for the bin. So sit down, spend time before you go out on the reservoir for that first day. Sort all your kit, your flies, your leaders, your lines, but the last thing, your waterproofs. When was the last time you wore them? It could be the last day of last season. Now, you should have put them away nice and clean. <laughs> I've been wearing these through the winter, they're all muddy. Um, but if you haven't worn them for some time, check all the seams. Turn them inside out, check all the seams. There's no frayed bits. Um, check the seat as well and the gusset so the seams haven't been stretched. The last thing you want to do, first day out, you're enjoying yourself, it pours with the rain and you get soaking wet. So a little preparation will go a long way making sure that you enjoy that first day of the new season. And now it's time to check this week's headlines. It's over to David with the news. This is Fishing Britain News. A British woman who landed a 500 pound fish while on holiday in Thailand has been told it could be a world record. Dawn Hull needed help to hold up her monster catch. She was with her husband, Adi, and son, Dan, at a lake in southern Thailand when she caught the nine foot South American arapaima, which may set an international game fishing association record for the largest freshwater fish ever caught by a woman. Fish Tweed is handing over a cheque for £3,000 to the Tweed Foundation. The money was raised through anglers giving donations when making bookings on the Fish Tweed website and will be used towards the Foundation's extensive programme of biological research, monitoring and habitat enhancement. Polluting a Scottish salmon river has led to a fine of £26,000. The owners of Scotland's largest abattoir have been fined after an incident in which the stomach contents of slaughtered beasts leaked into a tributary of top Scottish salmon river, the Allen in Stirlingshire. Widespread dredging in some communities could make flooding worse, not better. That's the conclusion of a new report published by the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. Anglers in particular are concerned that politicians could be about to take us back to the 60s and 70s, turning many rivers into straightened flood channels in order to be seen to be doing something. You are now to date with Fishing Britain News. Fishing for facts, landing the stories. Are you the type of angler that grabs a pack of crisps and a bar of chocolate or eats the luncheon meat at your feet or even calls for a takeaway? where we show you how to enjoy a home-cooked meal on the bank. What's in the pan, Jan? Hi there. Well, probably one of the most popular dishes for anglers is a pot noodle, and, and certainly it's in my repertoire. Uh, the chicken and mushroom one is my favourite. So what I thought I'd do for this dish is do a take on a, a chicken and mushroom pot noodle, but with the real thing. And just go through the other ingredients, mushrooms, some spicy noodles, a bit of veg, just for those who are into healthy eating, which is sweet corn and uh, fresh sweet peas. A bit of soy sauce, freshly ground black pepper, which you cannot beat. So I'm gonna throw the, the chicken, this chicken breast, nice and fresh. Okay, so the chicken's gone white all over, but just to give it a little bit of an extra blast, just whack the lid on. I'm going to leave this for another two minutes. 
That'll mean the heat goes right the way through the meat, make sure it's cooked. I don't like undercooked chicken at all. It's uh, one of my sort of no-nos. It's cooked thoroughly now. I'm just gonna transfer that into another pan. And then I'm gonna add the mushrooms because the mushrooms cook a lot quicker than the chicken. Add a little bit of oil to this. You can use any kind of oil. So maybe two teaspoons. Coat that all over. And just to zap it up, just wet the lid back on again. So give them a good old shake around and then you can see like magic. And they're pretty much cooked now. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to add some peas and sweet corn into that. And that's just going to warm those up. I don't really care if they don't get too thoroughly cooked. I quite like them a bit crispy. And to that I'm going to add some soy sauce. The local Luftwaffe flies over. About two tablespoons of soy sauce. That's just going to cool it down a little bit. So I'm back with the lid on again. So again, we'll get that up to a nice temperature. I know the chicken's cooked through. And then finally, I'm just going to add some spicy noodles, Singapore noodles. Two portions, because I know there's a hungry Welshman around the corner. I'm literally just going to toss those in. And then just fold that across the top. And then I'm just going to steam that through. So the next time you see this, it'll be ready. But I'm just going to put the lid on it again for another couple of minutes. <laughs> Don't know what it is. <laughs> ah, but it ain't half pulling my string, I tell you that now. I haven't seen it. Look at it, it's just pulling. You got one mate, well done. <laughs> I heard well, you shouting, I was just knocking a few <laughs> what's in the pans up over there and uh, I said he'll be over in a minute and he's... I tell you what, bit, uh, listen, it's your inventory. lure, so I did as you said, yeah. lobbed it out, on the bottom, on the bottom, jig, 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 and the only thing I could relate to it was if I'm checking in thing, you know, on, um, on Grayling on the river, yeah. and it was just like, keep it on bottom, you said slow, 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 just let it sit for a while and then tap, 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 and then I chucked it way out there. And I tell you what, it just went Boom. solid, and I thought, that's, that's bottom. Then yeah. the bottom started to move. Yeah. <laughs> and then my leg, he started shaking. Then I started oh, shouting at you lot. I heard you shouting. Uh, oh, what is it? It's a funny colour. Ah, oh, don't tell me. <laughs> we were supposed to be jigging for um, pike. I can't but believe that. <laughs> I'll tell you what, right? That's a, a carp on a lure. What can I say? That's a first. I mean, I mean I've, my daughters have caught fish, bream and uh, perch, obviously, uh, chub. I've, and I know people have caught on dead baits because I used to sell uh, sprats in the winter time and I used to catch carp on them in the winter. But I've never, it's the first time I've ever seen one take a lure. So you, I said, do the lottery tonight, that's what I'd say. <laughs> He's, had a, he's, had a, he's got it in the mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's definitely gone after it. Right, Mr. P, first ever big carp. Didn't even <laughs> knew that they'd actually it. take a lure. Nailed well, there it. it is. Yeah. Right in the top lip. I mean, basically, they eat boilies, they, be, they eat everything. So they eat little fish as well, then. Yeah, that's nice and clean. Unbelievable. <laughs> but in, in terms of holding it, you've got, yep. to be, you've got to be failure, so you just stick two fingers up at me. Okay. And then stick them under the fins, under the peg. Under there. And under there. And not too high off the mat, not too forward to the camera. Big cheesy one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and that's the reason why we use the mat and obviously don't yep. lift it too high. Okay. Um, but we will weigh it. That is a gorgeous fish, I must say. Yeah, it's I a pretty say. fish. It's a I can see fish. why people get excited about carp fishing. Got it's under nine pounds. Oh, it's not. Get out of it. Look at that. It's over nine pounds. Is it? Yeah. Nine, two. Nine, two. nine pounds. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to yep. just slip that net out of the way in the unhooking mat. Okay, mate. And then literally, I'm just going to 
lower it into the water, and then there's no chance of it getting damaged. Got ya. And then literally just there we go. let him go. First Thank you very much. Oh, mate, you are a jammy <laughs> sorry, sir. I'm not kidding. Guess what? I'd rather be lucky than skillful any day. Yeah, well done, pal. <laughs> well done. And there we have my pan chicken and mushroom noodle dish. Now that was mind blowing. I didn't even know carp took lures. And now for some more extraordinary catches, it's over to Charlie with Hooked on YouTube. Charlie Jacoby here. This is my weekly roundup of the best fishing on YouTube. James Bianchi from Plumpton College is impressed with the quality of carp fishing, winter carping with a good result. A video created by one of Plumpton's current intake of fishery management students. Good work by the carp madmen. Viewer Philip Rydbeck shares a true Swedish pike fishing legend. It is, and forgive the accent, Stefan Trumman Trumstead and Torbjorn Buster Oden fishing in the Blekinger archipelago around 2000 to 2005 with the back then new jerkbait buster Jerk from Strike Pro. Back to the present day and James Robbins from Shakespeare TV fishes at Earlswood Lakes near Birmingham. The video explains tips relating to feeder fishing for Bremont Lakes and also presents a product, the new Agility EXP feeder. Going to North America and here are salmon fishing highlights for Ukluelet, British Columbia. It's a promo film designed to make you move to BC. Slightly more creative Oregon coastal Chinook salmon float fishing comes to you from the 2013 full Chinook salmon run, a vintage season. This video showcases float fishing using either salmon jigs or special cured eggs and sand shrimp. Okay, it's ice fishing season so everyone else in North America is ice fishing. In this film, Waters and Woods catches fish after fish. And in this film, some swearier anglers haul out a big pike from Lake Tobin in Saskatchewan, Canada. It was safely released, they assure us. Now it is cold in North America and indescribably grey and drizzly in the UK at the moment, so here is something to cheer us up. Venice, Louisiana Blue Marlin Fishing with Paradise Outfitters is a review of 2013, a record year on Blue Marlin. Yeehaw! Click on the links to watch the videos or you will find them in this film's description. If you would like to send in a video for Hooked on YouTube, ping me the link, Charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv It's now time to go to Bishop's Bowl Fishery for some winter carp fishing in bait, tackle, fish! Tomorrow I've been invited out by Jan Porter to do some winter carp fishing and we're going to be doing some dobbing with bread. Now I'm not sure what that means but I'm a fly fisherman at heart. So he's gonna be using bread. So I'm gonna be using a fly that looks like bread. Right, first of all, better silk has gone on, then just to cut off a big chunk of Arctic Fox so I can bulk up the middle part of the fly, dub it in, catch it in the end. And then what you must do when you, you tie it in the hook, unlike other dubbings, you tie it in loosely so it's easier to, to tease out afterwards. Tie all that in, just a little bit extra head just to bulk it out and then whip finish and then just tease it out with a needle until it looks like a piece of bread that's on the hook but it's starting to disintegrate and there's little bits just coming off. So you're looking with a fly that's got a, like a cloud of uh, particles around it. And if you think that these are too long, cut them off, just pinch them off. There we go red fly. Okay, I'm just going to show you a very quick uh, technique here, which a lot of match anglers call dobbing. It's a case of dropping around the swim in the winter months and the colder temperatures and trying to find a fish that's just sat there. So we're going to use some bread. You can use any you want, but this is um, soft white. Take all the crusts off, put it in a blender or liquidizer, fizz it all up until it's nice and fluffy. Um, here's some I made earlier. It's a great base mix. You can use this in PVA stockings, you can use it in opening feeders, cage feeders, etc. Fantastic for chub, but equally good for roast. And you can find them out with catapult and stuff like that. So it's just a, a nice way of getting bread out at distance. If you don't want to use a PVA stocking, you can just simply use the compactor and make some big pellets. And it'll float initially on the top of the water and within a few seconds it'll absorb the water and then start to break down. But as you can see it's so porous it, it just breaks down and then you get this huge big bloom of bread in the water which they can't really eat the fish, they just go through it, they dive through it and then the only thing they can eat is the, is the hook bait which makes it a perfect um, loose feed really. And then 
get the other slices, hold about five or six slices back, cut the crusts off them, put them in a microwave for about 10, 15 seconds, take them out, roll them flat with a rolling pin and then put them into some cling film and that will keep them nice and uh, moist and, and keep them in the right condition you need. Then using a luncheon meat punch or similar bread punch, piece of carbon fibre pole, punch out some discs and this will depend on what size punch you use. These are around about 12 mil, I would imagine. And then just punch them out and then you've got a series of little discs there which you can put on a, a baiting needle. I'm going to put three of these on here. Two, three. Onto a, a hook link, which is a size 12 strong barbless hook. And then I'll finish that off with a little hair stop. Now what happens with that when it goes into the water, immediately it starts to swell up and becomes a much fluffier uh, um, component than it is already. And that's very, very attractive to fish. So that's pretty much it. That is dobbing on the bread for carp in the winter months. Told you tonight that Jan was going to be all Gordon Ramsay on us. Well, I kept it simple. You've seen the bait. This is the tackle, number one. Going to use a floating line. Powerful rod, nine foot six, eight weight. Fluorocarbon, that fox dub fly. And then what I'm using is this floating stuff. It's a paste, it's a putty. And the great thing with this is I can just change the depth by just moving it up. Or if I want to decrease the depth, just move it down towards the fly. Simple, easy. And then the other one. This is out of a carp angler's book. Powerful rod, nine foot six, eight weight again. Then on the business end, we've got that foam with a stopper on the end, hair rigged onto the hook and a super, super fast sinking line that's gonna take it all the way down to the deck really, really quickly. Okay, I've got three number four shots right where the hook link and the main line joins together. That's just to add a little bit of ballast to the, um, to the actual hook bait. It won't cock the float because it's about half the capacity of the float. Onto the main line, which is um, eight to 10 pound. You want something substantial. There's carp in here and lots of waters over double figures. The float itself I'm using is a small peacock insert. And this is really just as something to suspend the line above the water and I'm stopping it with a couple of rubber sliding stops which are available at most tackle shops. Just a, a point here, I've got an adapter on the float. Uh, I tend to use adapters all the time. If I damage the float or if I decide I want a different colour, it's just a case of popping that off and you don't have to completely renew the rig. In terms of the way I'm going to put the stops, I can either have it fixed so it locks the float or I prefer to have it so it's actually moving and I'll drop the the lower of the two, about a foot away, and then I've got a sliding float, and it doesn't really matter too much about the depth. I can move around and the float will just lie flat. Onto the rod itself, this is a, a peculiar rod in as much as it's a nine foot rod. It, it comes in an 11 foot two piece configuration with a removable section, and I use these a lot uh, over the years. Uh, it's called a 911 tribal rod. Uh, very, very powerful. It's got a test curve of about one now after one and three quarters, I would suggest. Uh, very, very soft tip action, so it's great for float fishing. I use it for all types of fishing, actually. Um, and down to the reel, this is a Shimano Bait Runner 4000, which is the smallest of the Bait Runner family. And for those technophiles out there who've spotted the spool, this is off a Technium 4000, just in case you write in and complain about it. The standard one is a different color to that. Bait Runner is great if you want to put the rod down and put it on the free spool mode there. So that's it, that's my kit. Very, very basic, very, very light. Bucket, a few bits of bobs um, to, to bait up, bit of bread, bit of punch crumb, and then we're stalking around and trying to find a fish. I've been told you've really got to be sneaky when carp fishing. Trying to get this 
putty as close into the bank as possible. It's gone behind the reason I'm just trying to find. I've got a gap about an inch wide. Just watching that orange thing, but oh, there we go. Let's come back out a little bit. And I've had a couple of just little, call them nibbles if you want. Yeah, that's a bite. Ah, well. <laughs> At long last, I managed to snare one. <laughs> Good man. Uh, I've took a, a little bit of um, local advice, namely Sean the... Right, what have you done then? Well, I've changed the main line. I was on braid before and it was a bit heavy, so I put some lighter line on. Oh. And actually, yeah, we've got one. <laughs> <laughs> it's fish! <laughs> Now, after catching that fish from these reeds, Jan's been fishing right on the edge of it. This pole here is an extension handle to put the GoPro in, and we're actually... <laughs> you, you, you won't believe this. This is uh, two foot away from the bank, in the middle, right in the middle of the reeds, and, I mean... Ah, oh, this is ridiculous, Jan, isn't it? Well, it's impossible to fish here. People do, and hook and hold, but it's not the kind of environment we'd, we'd fish or recommend, but... I mean, you couldn't even get a bait through that. No. All the surface reeds and everything. But and as, look at these. As Sean, the owner, said, they're in here, and they are, and this is the hot spot. You've just <laughs> got to get that bait right on the edge and hope. But this is literally a foot from the bank. Yeah. I mean, and they've, they've got four or five foot to go out, at least through the reeds, to where you put in yeah. your bait. Look, look. But there's a lot of fish there. And we just put some maggots in, Owl. There's some behind us. I've got, right. brought a few maggots. If you chuck some maggots in, you'll see what happens. Literally, chuck them on the end of the pole. Right, where are you? Well, it just shows you how tight these fish pod up. And there's features here, so that's always going to hold them. But you could fish any commercial water or any, any water with any type of species. And there'll be one spot where most of the fish are shoaled up and the rest of the lake... Here we go, look at maggots little. drop. There's a maggots dropping yeah. down. Yeah, and I mean, this is just incredible. <laughs> I mean, I mean, walking past this, you would, seeing there, looking there, there's not a movement. No, there's not, no, not a the reeds are not moving, nothing. You think, yeah, for, you, you, you see now, they, they're just they're a starting to, and now they're gaining a bit of confidence. Now we stood still. They're, they're feeding on those maggots. It doesn't really matter what you put down there. And that's why these lads who are fishing the matches, they fish, just like I was fishing on the waggler, but on a pole, and they just drop a piece of bread down, and they're just literally dabbing, or dobbing, they call it. Yeah, so they're chucking... And, and they're putting any loose feed in. Not like we're doing now. We're just trying to encourage them to yeah, yeah. up a bit, but... There's the maggots in the background. Yeah. I just chucked them a little bit further, closer to them, but... You wouldn't need... If you could fish on a pole on the edge of here now and drop that bait down on the noses, you'd catch a lot more fish. Just unfortunately on the waggler with the wind, it's difficult to yeah, but you couldn't present even... it. Well, you couldn't fish here. No. And you wouldn't want to. But isn't it beautiful just seeing them <laughs> tantalizingly so close? Yeah, but the thing is, right, we've gone around. I mean, you fish there, you fish there, <laughs> I fish there, we fish there, we fish there. And they're all of them hiding in the yeah, reeds. The maggot just drops there. Do you think it's the wind, you know, in the winter, it's just they feel comfortable in cover and... They feel comfortable in numbers. Yeah. Um, now, they're cold-blooded creatures, but I know uh, a lad who used to run sports in his lodge in Northampton, Phil, and he kept koi carp. And in the wintertime, they're all in one corner of his big pond. Yeah. Almost like they're keeping warm. I know it sounds crazy, but it's almost like they're cuddling up in the wintertime. But, I mean, these fish are feeding, so they just pod up really tight. That's why you get these huge, big match weights in one or two swims. Yeah. That is unbelievable. What's the biggest one you think you've seen? I reckon there's been one there about five or six pounds. They, they look much bigger than probably. Yeah, they? They're all about the same stamp, the majority of them like the one we caught. Yeah. But there is a couple of big ones keep popping through now, and, and we're losing a bit of the clarity now because they've churned it all up, and you can yeah. see the suspensions. They're root, rooting for those maggots, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, I and mean, we only put about 30, 40 maggots in, and immediately they came to it. I saw the, the reeds flicking a little bit when the wind died down, and then... Um, literally put the camera down and, and there was one came up and said hello. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> I think we should just do more of this and less uh, fishing, yeah, you know, this it. is a lot you know. more fun. Doesn't he look like a little gnome? 
I'm going to let him carry on fishing. And yes, bread caught a carp today, but that's not to say in the future that flies won't catch him as well. And there is a lesson from today. He's a coast fisherman, I'm a fly fishing. And we've been sharing tactics and we all should do that. It'll make us all better anglers in the future. That was amazing. Who would have thought? Capped, packed in like sardines in the reeds. Well, folks, that's it for another week. If you've enjoyed this programme, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. If you want to keep up to date with all the other programmes on the channel, go to fieldsportschannel.tv and hit that constant contact form. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. I'll see you next week on Fishing Britain.